I'm happy and jet lag to introduce you, uh, Ricardo Chavez. He received his PhD at INAOE in 2014 while working with Robert Terlevich on cosmological constraints using al alternative tracers. Um, he followed this up with a fellowship at Cambridge. Uh, since 2019, he has been um, a CONACYT fellow at IRIA. Ricardo uses photometry and spectra in the study of stellar population in galaxies. He also works on SED models using SPS, whatever that is, uh, and studies the evolutionary history of the universe via cosmological tracers. Today, he will present his results on cosmological constraints from high relative H2 galaxies. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, this um, work is essentially a follow-up of the last one that I present here by two years ago or something like that, or almost three years ago, maybe. This is a paper that was, was published last year, essentially, and uh, is uh, I will present you the main results, and I will introduce the general idea, and then present the main results, and then at the end I will present some new advances since then in this um, analysis. So, um, the, main, the main idea behind this use of uh, H2 galaxies to constrain cosmological constant came from uh, giant uh, H2 regions. Uh, since the end of the 70s and uh, beginning of the 80s, uh, it was noted that um, there were some giant extragalactic H2 regions in some nearby galaxies and they present certain scaling relations, essentially relations between their luminosity, uh, their velocity dispersion, and their uh, radius, their size. So a kind of fundamental plane similar to the one of um, uh, elliptical uh, galaxies or the same general idea of, the, of, the, of those times. The name for these giant extragalactic issue regions came from uh, um, the, the research at that, at that time, and examples, this is NGC 54, 55 in M101 and uh, 30 Dorados at, at the LMC. Uh, 30 Dorados is maybe the, one of the most studied objects in the, in the, in the nearby universe. And it's like kind of the prototype of this kind of objects. So uh, knowing that there, there are these scaling relations, the research continued in the 80s. And in the 80s, the, the name ah, before that, <laughs> this is the kind of relation, uh, the scaling relation that we can find in this kind of uh, extragalactic H2 regions. Basically, here we have the uh, logarithm of the velocity dispersion in the x axis and the luminosity in the y axis. And we can see a relatively tight correlation between, between both uh, quantities. Here we have a series of giant H2 regions in nearby galaxies, essentially. Here I'm showing the names and the um, uh, distance moduli for every one of, of, of them. And the kind of relation that you get is the one that I'm showing the insect. Basically, uh, the, uh, the slope is around 5, and we have a, 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 a zero point of around 33.23 with those uh, quoted errors. And the RMS is like 0.263, so it's a relatively tight correlation between uh, luminosity and velocity dispersion. So, could you remind me why you use H beta? Uh, because it's essentially easy to observe. Yes. You can use essentially any any recombination like but H beta or H alpha. H alpha would be easier in principle, <laughs> but at those times and at that time it will be more or less contaminated with the uh, nitrogen lines possible. So when it was started, it was started with H beta. Also at that time, the, the detectors were more sensible in the bluish region. Again, in that was some of the, of the reasons. But well, traditional, you can use also a shelf. There are more points in the plot than in the legend. Yeah, there, there are more than one region by, by galaxy. So we have NGC 6822, you, you have this. Two, two regions or the LMC, the LMC that is around here is 30 Dorados, basically. So the repeated points here is basically more than one region per, per galaxy. 
So this started to be done in the in the 80s, as I said before, and um, uh, at that time they realized that maybe if they can observe these kind of objects further away in a more uh, remote galaxies, they can start use them to measure distances. Here we have the distance, the by surface essentially. We have measured the distance with surface for every one of these of these uh, galaxies. But maybe we can use these uh, scaling relations to try to uh, obtain distance for for a uh, further away um, objects. So uh, in that time, was going the name H two galaxies. H two galaxies is a um, misnomer in a sense. <laughs> they are not really a H there are no real galaxies in in a sense. The what we call H two galaxies is essentially the parts of the uh, dominant parts of star formation in a uh, dwarf galaxy. So most of the luminosity of the galaxy is dominated but by this current uh, burst of star formation. Uh, uh, they are called H2 galaxies in analogy with um, the H2 region, with the extragalactic H2 regions that they observed before. But well, since then, since the, since the 80s, the name H2 galaxies has been used, and we are keeping using the nomenclature, but it's only the name. But it's only a matter of style, if you like. Many of them now are also uh, green peas. Only green peas are identified also only in our observed range of redshifts. Previous were identified in the um, slow and digital sky survey. But essentially, are the same kind of objects, only slightly different way of um, selecting them. H2 galaxies are select uh, spectroscopically, and green peas are select photometrically. Photometry of the, of the object, but essentially it's, uh, they are similar kind of objects in general. They are a, a, a great um, intersection between both families. So H2 galaxies essentially are these uh, further uh, away dwarf galaxies that are dominated by um, a current burst of star formation, of a local burst of star formation. And essentially you can you see uh, they look like that in the slow digital sky survey. They look, look essentially like a blob of, uh, of light. Uh, uh, the most compact, here we are selecting to be fair, the most compact ones, but there are a few that are a little more irregular, but they look more or less like that. In the spectrum, in the optical spectra of them, of these objects is dominated by emission lines, as you can see here. These are two examples. Uh, emission lines, uh, um, essentially the oxygen oxygen emission lines here, or the uh, Balmer emission lines, they dominate completely the, the optical spectra. The continuum is very low compared with the, with the uh, uh, emission lines. They are select to be like that. May, the main uh, selection criteria is that they have an H beta equivalent with larger than 50 angstroms. So you can be sure that you have a young uh, starburst, basically around the five mega years starburst or younger. So in that way, we can avoid um, many of the complications that can be produced by more evolved uh, kind of, of starbursts. I will abound on that uh, later. Uh, in a BPT diagram, you can uh, uh, see them in this kind of region. These are H2 galaxies. The GPs, the green peas, are almost in the same uh, lossy or locus. <laughs> uh, so uh, they, are, they share many of their properties. The DCDs, the blue compact dwarfs, are less, um, the ionization fraction is less important in DCDs, but are more or less. There are a region around here where they intersect, basically. Uh, this line here in, uh, in green is, uh, is, is, approximate, is approximately the um, division that we choose to, to select H2 galaxies, an equivalent width on H beta larger than 50 angstroms. So we can separate more or less well VCDs uh, and H2, general VCD population and H2 galaxies, as we can see here. Here are several samples, and uh, between them, there is this paper, Chavez 2014. It's a local sample of H2 galaxies, 128 
that we select using discrete criteria and is the basis, the local sample for the analysis that we are uh, proposing here. Uh, this sample was observed at BLT and, um, and at um, KET at the time. And uh, uh, for getting the, the high resolution and spectra, high resolution optical spectra. And also observed in the smaller telescopes, to Peter class telescopes, to get uh, uh, the absolute photometry. This is this sample. The kind of uh, uh, L sigma relation, the kind of relation between velocity dispersion and luminosity that, that we get for that sample in 2014 was this one. Here, the distances are estimated uh, choosing uh, H, H naught, uh, Hubble constant. So uh, we have measures only for sigma and the flux here. We don't have no measures, direct measures to the distances for these objects. But still, you can see that we have here the, the still a relatively tight uh, correlation. Here, the RMS is slightly higher than in the uh, Gaian stereoelectric H2 regions. So now we have two samples one that we have distance measure with the phase, and one that we don't have this, this distance measure. So the idea is to um, basically anchor this local sample, relatively local sample. I didn't mention it before, but the redshift here is up to 0.15. Uh, so we have these two samples, and the idea is to anchor this further away sample that share more or less the same pro properties with the local sample that we have measures, uh, distance measured with Cephate. And anchoring this sample, we can estimate uh, essentially a uh, Hubble constant. That was the first idea that we had at the time. We did that around, uh, we have first a paper in 2012 and this one 2018, doing exactly that, anchoring the local H2 region sample with the uh, giant extragalactic H2 region. Here in blue, we have the giant extragalactic H2 regions. At that moment, we had around 44 giant extragalactic H2 regions to anchor a sample of 107 H2 galaxies from Chavez 2014 another 23 uh, H2 galaxies from Bordalo and Teles in uh, 2011. And with that methodology, we got an H node of around 72.8, what was at that time relatively uh, similar to the results from Supernovae 1A. Here the error marks quote, plus 2.6 minus 2.5, are all always uh, are evidently larger than the supernovae one a results, but you can see that we have much less objects than supernovae one a that. And anyway, I'm not, I'm not getting, I don't, I will not concentrate the, the results on, on each not. I will try to get to uh, the other cosmological parameters, but this paper is very interesting in that, in that sense. This is only to show you what was the state of the art at the moment. This is Friedman 2017. And this is the kind of results that we, we were getting for H0. We choose supernovae one a essentially base and C phase base and the um, plan data from that time. At that time, <clears throat> at that time, the, the tension in the Hubble constant was, was starting to get well established, and we are now trying to get better results for H0. Try to wait on this on this on this. Um, this problem was. It looks like the first one is the good one, no? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so let's do some theory about this. We have this picture of the universe, the expanding universe and the acceleration expansion and uh, because of dark energy. If we assume that the universe is really flat, as we suspect from the data and for, for, from all the data essentially. Basically, we need to get H naught, omega matter, and omega lambda to constrain the cosmological parameter of the universe. If we additionally uh, suppose that the equation of the state of the dark energy is evolving, we can parameterize it in several ways, but we, we will use a simpler one, essentially a Taylor expansion. So we can have the two first um, terms of the expansion W naught and W1 or W naught and WA, depending on the literature. And we need to constrain then another couple of parameters. 
we have already talk, talked about um, H naught, where we will start to talk now about omega matter and omega lambda and the rest of parameters. <clears throat> we, for constraining this kind of parameters, we need to go further away. So in the last few years, we have been collecting data from BLT and KEC. Um, basically, we collect data with MOSFAR and with um, KMOS and from galaxies from redshift 1, redshift 2.5. And we try to use this data to constrain the cosmological parameters of the standard lambda CDM uh, model. And we published a paper already with MOSFAR in 2019. I talked about I talked about this paper uh, in the, my last talk. <laughs> so today I will be talking about the most recent results with data from KMOS. That's what I will be talking in this talk. And then going towards that, this is the paper published uh, last year. Basically, it was in the usual collaboration in this in this uh, series of papers that we are having now. Analisa. Robert Gonzalez Moran was doing her PhD thesis at that moment, and he finished very, very well with this paper, basically, her, her thesis. So, this is the sample. Uh, this is the sample that we get from KMOS. This is only the, as you can see, there are lots of small blobs, basically. <laughs> uh, this is the acquisition images of, of, uh, of, the, of the spectra that we are taking. We have two fields, essentially. Or triply, and we have the field UDS in, in good south, and the field uh, Cosmos and Q2343. Q it's the fields that we have for this, this uh, data. They are well known cosmological fields. So we, we observe on that, on that, uh, that field, essentially. The kind of spectra that we get from Cosmos, uh, sorry, from KMOS is this one. This is the Optical rest frame of the. Is it near infrared? It's near infrared. Yeah, but the rest frame is optical, optical rest frame. <clears throat> and this is comparing KMOS versus MOSFAR. MOSFAR was the data from, from KEG. As you can see, it's more or less the same. <laughs> uh, MOSFAR is still at, it's slightly better, to be fair, with the same amount of observing time. Uh, MOSFAR does slightly better than, than KMOS. Uh, it's the same object, uh, of course, uh, and um, um, we get uh, here the oxygen oxygen lines and HV tab here, as you can you can see. HV is close to know so well. <laughs> At this point, we realize that maybe it would be better to use the oxygen lines, and you also can use the oxygen lines for the analysis. Only that you need to add an extra correction for the uh, velocity dispersion. It, there is a well-known um, difference. Systematic difference between the velocity dispersion in the oxygen uh, 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 lines and the uh, collisional lines and the recombination lines is well known since the 80s. Uh, and and we, uh, we can use also oxygen, oxygen tree to the work. So, so, of, so you didn't use H beta because the signal to noise. But you still we, need. We measure both. Okay, because so, you still need to re de rest yeah, the line. Yeah. We actually, we measure both and we try to use both, and I will show you them. So, and this is the kind of correlation that you get um, uh, of the of this uh, adding all the data, basically. Here we have the giant extragalactic two regions here in dark blue. In the slightly lighter blue, <laughs> you have the local galaxies that I showed you before. In um, green, here you have data from the literature, and in um, uh, pink, you have MOSFAR data. MOSFAR data, we have also a couple of points here, here next shooter, and the orange ones are KMOS data. All the KMOS, MOSFAR, and next shooter data all are about uh, Redshift 1. Also, the literature data all are about Redshift 1 and up to Redshift 2.6. Uh, as I said before, when we were able to measure direct to measure directly H beta when the signal to noise was good enough, we used H beta directly. When we were not able because of the signal, signal to noise, we used oxygen three and we correct to the H beta. Only uh, we need to add to the error project. 
we need to add an additional error for that that we take. And this is the kind of for correlation. The RMS is around 0.369, so it's slightly worse than before, <laughs> of course. But we are here at high redshift, so well, we cannot not expect any 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 other thing. Here, uh, for, for an idea of what's the kind of uh, dispersion that we have, this is the, this histogram shows the dispersion around the feet, essentially the residuals around the feet, and it should be perfectly Gaussian, it's not perfectly Gaussian, obviously, but it's not that far from doing a Pomorov syndrome of test is reasonable Gaussian. Uh, this is another way of showing the data in a Hubble diagram. Here we have the redshifts in the three different range, essentially, and the data in these different ranges. And uh, here we have here the local anchor data up to redshift point 005, the local history galaxies up to redshift point uh, 15, and the high redshift data from point redshift point uh, 6 to redshift uh, 2.5, etc. So you can see how that is the spread in the in the residuals is getting worse and worse, but well, this is what you get essentially. Not be otherwise. The delta here is in distance modular and is plus minus three in the T in the three panels. Well, with that data, uh, we the first task was to constrain to constrain omega matter. We use um Variation approach to the to the um, uh, estimation of the parameters, and we use a um, Monte Carlo uh, sampler to do the analysis. We use the multinest sampler to, to do the analysis. Uh, here in uh, red is the sub the analysis the result from this paper is essentially omega matter equals two point two four five two four four plus minus or something like that, I cannot see from okay. well, plus minus 04, basically. And the previous analysis from 2000, 2019 is in green. And uh, we add a further restriction to what we call our data. Into our data is uh, using only our, our data and excluding the literature data. It's only using our measure data. As you can see, excluding the literature data doesn't change a lot the result. But we have an uh, interesting change from the past analysis from 2019. From one sense, in one sense, we have reduced the error bars essentially. You can see also it very clearly here. This is the 2019 analysis in green, and this work is in blue here in this band. Also, here we are comparing with all the recent determinations of Omega Matter from this Pantheon data for Neumann AG, LA. C11, C11, reanalyze, etc. etc. Planck results here. As we can see, we are not fully consistent with Planck. We are interestingly fully consistent with the supernovae 1A in C11. We are relatively, relatively uh, consistent or perhaps still consistent with the supernovae 1A data from, from Pantheon. Uh, but we definitely are not consistent with, with Planck, as we can see here, obviously, but at this point, it's not really a big deal because our bars are, are big, but we are still trying to under, understand what's happening with Omega Matter in our analysis here. It's also a relatively different from the one that we get from, from 2019. So the, inside the error bars, there is not really a difference, but it's interesting that we are drifting towards a lower value of omega matter. When you try to constrain omega matter and H naught uh, together, you get this difference from the previous analysis. This in, in green, we have the 2019 analysis, and in red, you have the current analysis. And you, have, you see there how it drifts, drifts literally towards lower values of omega matter. H naught really doesn't change a lot, gets more or less in the, in the same spot, but you are drifting towards lower values of omega matter. Next, to try to constrain, obviously, uh, W0, the equation of the state's uh, parameter, the dark energy equation of this parameter and omega matter together, when we get this, these results. Here, on W0 is relatively what you expect, minus one, inside the error bars. 
and still is um, relatively not that well constrained, which to be true, you should consider that we have around 200 objects here. So it's, it's not that, that far from, from, it's not unexpected, let's say that. Here we're comparing with um, all regular determinations. Here, uh, omega matter and W not in all the cases are constrained together. So in, in the, you sh we choose this, this data to this uh, joint constraint, constraint of these two parameters. Here we compare with um, our work of 2019, the puncture result, JLA and Union 2.1. All, all of these three are supernovae 1A based. Uh, as you can see, Omega matter, omega matter is <laughs> very similar in this case to the JLA results. You should consider that at that time, supernovae, there were 740 supernovae 1A in that analysis, and we are using 181 H2 galaxies in this analysis. Uh, we, we see here it's still the, it's like, it's slightly, uh, a slight difference with Panther. And in W0, well, everything is inside the error bar essentially. There is no big deal in W0 because we are not restricting that well W0 node at this stage. Actually, doing simulations, we, we know that to constrain that W0 to the kind of result that uh, JLI has in 2014, we need around 500 supernova 1A. So we are still a bit away from that one. Uh, 500 H2 galaxies, I, I should have said. <laughs> Here we have um, together the restriction between omega matter and H0 and W0 of the three together. And this is the kind of result that you get. H0 is still quite fixed, uh, slightly above 0 0.7, 0.72, more or less, or 0.719. Uh, as you see there, it, it gets fixed at that position essentially. So we are restricting very consistently the value of H0. Omega matter, as you can see, is now when we do the together analysis around 0.25 and with this kind of error bars. And W0 is essentially the same thing before, no big difference. Um, when you do also everything together, including um, Alpha, alpha and beta, alpha and beta here are the, the nuisance parameters of our, our model. Basically, it's the two parameters that we can fit, two free parameters, and we can fit inside our model, the L sigma relation, essentially the slope the zero, and the zero point of the correlation. And if you, if you fit this, the, the nuisance parameters together with all the cosmological parameters, and you get this kind of result, essentially more or less the same again. H node 0.72, omega matter goes up slightly, which is interesting. This is actually interesting. Goes up to 0.274, that is more consistent with what you, what, with what you get from supernovae 1A and from um, our previous analysis. And W node gets exactly at minus one, very consistent with, consistent with, um, uh, dark, uh, with the cosmological constant. Here we compare with another uh, restrictions. Here we do the joint analysis with um, CMB data, environmental acoustic uh, oscillations. So here in red, uh, we, are, we are here restrict, restricting omega matter versus W0. As we know, it is always generate in all the, in all the methodologies. So we need to use another methodology to really constrain the values of omega matter and W not uh, together. And so here in, in blue is the CMB restriction at that moment. Well, it is really the final uh, CMB restriction, uh, 2018 data, so it's the final restriction. And barring acoustic oscillations at that moment, that was essentially, and we are there all around nine determinations that were ready available for barring oscillations at that, at that moment. And this is the kind of contours that you get. And the final contours, the addition of all the joint analysis of all this is in black here, a bit hidden, but it's <laughs> with the black result. It's much clearer here. This is the black, the black um, 
the black curve is the, the final, uh, the addition of the three in the, of the, of the three methodologies. Actually, I'm seeing very well from here. But yeah, it's that. Uh, uh, the same if we try to um, add the, for, for comparison, I'm showing here what happens with supernovae 1A, CMB, and barrier acoustic oscillations. We, we use here the Pantheon supernovae 1A uh, data. So you can see obviously with supernovae 1A, 1A plus CMB plus uh, barrier acoustic oscillations, you get much, become much um, uh, smaller. Um, uh, error bars for these, these results as you would expect. Them. But essentially, if you look both uh, plots together, they are very, very similar. You can see it better in this in this plot. Here we are uh, comparing what's the size of the um, uh, contours of H2 galaxies plus CMB plus barrier oscillations in, in black against Pernobi 1A plus CMB plus Barnacus oscillations in red. As you can see here in this, in this space, Omega Matter versus W naught, the difference is not that big considering the difference in the numbers. But when we do, we, we don't do that well, it's really in this space. Constraining W naught and WA or the first two, the first two terms in the Taylor expansion of the, of the, a parameter of the dark energy equation of the state, uh, we are still very far, still very far from the supernovae one a plus EMB plus parallel oscillations. So this, the, the most of the weight of future uh, data will be in reduce this uh, this this error bars here, essentially. Well, it's a interesting exercise. If you like. If you like <laughs> You may ask why is it this important? Why it's important to use another methodology for for um, trying to constrain cosmological parameters if we know the supernovae one a works very efficiently? Well, it's important because you you know that the systematics of this are different. So uh, analyzing the data and considering the systematics in each case made you probably will make you have a better idea of how the systematics are affecting each of the methodologies and also obviously for confirmation. Uh, now I will try to talk to you about a uh, recent uh, work on this line. In the first term, this is a very preliminary work that we are starting to do now with a uh, master student here at uh, IRIA with Bianca. Bianca Gonzalez, we are working on doing cosmography with these two galaxies. Basically, we will apply, uh, instead of applying to the Lambda CDM, Lambda CDM model, we will do it with cosmo cosmographic parameters to try to constrain each node and the first cosmographic parameters of the expansion, essentially the deceleration parameter in KO or in SO as, a, as an additional one. Um, this is a very, very preliminary result, so not, not important yet, but we see that still it's consistent essentially with what, with what we expect from Q0 and K0. I remind you that you expect Q0 to minus 0.5 essentially, and J0 to around 1 for the Lambda CDM uh, model. Uh, we are also doing analysis of um, some of these H2 galaxies and much more detailed analysis of these objects. We are using Megara for one of these galaxies, J084220. Here you see the, um, the contours in, 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 well, you see first <laughs> some blocks here. The red data is from, from HST. Also, you see here the fiber from the slow. The slow fiber covers only this block here. There is a, a, a really another blow that you can see in HST. Essentially, this is the filter of HST that is really the, the data. We have also data from X-rays for, for this subject from Chandra in green. And we are doing a very detailed analysis of this, this object. You can see here the maps of HPT equivalent width, the H-alpha equivalent width, the uh, extinction parameter, etc. So this will be published soon. It's submitted already and under revision. 
Uh, we are also doing work with that same object in X-rays, trying to simulate what will be the behavior of this X-rays in this uh, in this object. As, we, as I said before, we have X-rays from from Chandler, and we will trying to see um, if we can explain the X-rays with um, the expect winds produced by this burst of star formation. Is one of the hypotheses that we are trying to test. For that, we do we did some simulations. This is doing done, done here at Iria also with uh, Jesus and Veronica and Susana and Stau here. And we are almost finished finishing this this paper also. And uh, I will talk, talk about uh, some future work. Uh, soon uh, with an instrument at the Herschel telescope at the is Isaac group of telescope in the Canary Islands. We'll start to, to get data. The first light is expect to the 1st of August of this year or around that. And we this a uh, multi object and IFU and IFU system. You can work in a multi object way or an, of, in an IT way. Essentially, there are lots of, um, a, of um, yeah, resolution elements. <laughs> a, Optic fiber, essentially. <laughs> Sorry for I I, I forgot the, the, the word. Optic fibers that are moved robotically and put in the primary focus. So uh, you can uh, group them as bundles, or you can put use them as MOS, as multi-object as, as kind of multi-object spectrograph. You can bundle them to use as a mini iPhones, or you can use the entire field as a big iPhone. IFU, sorry. <laughs> So we have uh, assigned a project there uh, for working in this. It's, it will work essentially in, in, in survey mode. And we have assigned a project there for working uh, in the mini IFU mode. The idea is to get information from nearby galaxies with uh, of the most brilliant H2 regions of the nearby mm -hmm. galaxies. And we, every field is two by two degrees. The idea is that we will get uh, all the H2 galaxies, all, galax oh, sorry, all the H2 regions that we can observe in nearby galaxies, and the re remaining uh, mini IFUs will be distributed in the field to observe uh, field H2 galaxies. So we will try to constrain much better the, the physical properties of this kind of objects locally and also in the nearby uh, universe. Also, at the intermediate range, we have also time machine at um, Megara for a project to work with um, the most uh, mode. And uh, it's still ongoing. And it will cover from Redshift 1.5 to Redshift uh, 1, essentially. And we have a sign time for uh, BLT. We got time from BLT and Cake again, no, sorry, the GTC. Again, to observe some intermediate and, and uh, high redshift H2 galaxies to try to increase the size of the, of the sample. And uh, well, these are my concluding remarks. That essentially is what I said to you already. <laughs> and uh, it's that everything. Uh, it, that So, if you have any question, actually, also try to use the oxygen free line. Yeah. So, um, with this uh, dependence, uh, interdependence between the width of the line mm -hmm. and the luminosity. Yeah, but in that case, you, you uh, in any way, use the luminosity of the Valmer lines, not the luminosity of the Yeah, side. okay, because the, the oxygen free is also luminosity. Depends much more on the stellar range. Yeah, yeah that's true. Oh, okay. We use a, we use the luminosity of, in any case we use the luminosity of the Valmer. But you measured the, the velocity dispersion. The velocity dispersion. Oh, that's okay. And I want to also to ask, um, do you can you calculate the mass, the stellar mass of this? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have that in uh, 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 And, and uh, that's slightly large sum. What is the order of magnitude? They are uh, the stellar mass from around ten to the eight to ten to the nine. Oh. And uh, last question: um, Do you correct for each 
heat absorption. Yeah, we do the, uh, we, well, we implement a kind of, uh, there is a paper from 2002 from Daniel Rosa Gonzalez, where he used this parameter of um, underlying absorption. You try to uh, understand what's the kind of absorption that you get. We have, this is like a semi-analytical approach, but you also can try to do uh, it by population synthesis analysis. It's much more complicated. No, it's not. Ask me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I lost. <laughs> Thank you. But I, I will go to see you at your, at your office. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So thanks for the great talk. So in relation to uh, previous question, it was related to dust absorption. What we did No, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, absorption. Yeah, photospheric absorption. Yeah, photospheric okay. Absorption. Um, what about dust absorption? From the we we correct for that. Yeah. We use the Balmer decrement of the distinction. I okay. You can if you have H alpha and H beta. H alpha H beta gamma. Yeah. Overall, it's at least a shell condition. Okay, I, the original question I have is uh, so any plans to follow up some of these sources with Alma? I mean, you have an explicit. Well, we are exploring, starting to explore that idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we are trying to get some uh, neutral gas data, and it would be ideal to do it with Alma as an example. Yeah, because your sample yeah. is tiny. But well, it's difficult to get time now. Anyway. But yeah. it will be interesting to propose a strong, strong um, project to do that. Yeah, a large program, I think that is um, something I mean, short, but I think that you, it's, it's, you can justify that. You have a large sample, like what's the sample? Well, yeah. We, yeah. Thank you. Finally, trend uh, metallicity redshift. Metallicity with redshift. Actually, we have analyzed the metallicity only of the local sample. For the far away sample, the high redshift is very difficult. And dust. It's more dust. Dust, dust is interestingly they are not very affected affected by, by dust. Mm -hmm. The dust content is relatively low. And the uh, anything about the ionizing stars that is similar. I expect so the population. We are trying to constrain that also to try to. But we can establish if we if you assume that the we are the Merriman's assumption here is that the L sigma relation, the scaling relation, follows all along range. It's not the volume register. If you assume that you can establish certain limits with the uh, to the uh, initial uh, initial mass function, you, you can establish certain limits of variation for the initial mass function and with using this this data also. We are trying to explore more that now. How it, well, how the, how we can constrain the evolution of the initial, initial mass function with this, with the Because we see that our results are consistent with the cosmological analysis from other methodologies. That implies that the LC relation cannot deviate that much at any rate. So you can constrain also the initial mass function for low. Sorry, please. Uh, maybe we start with you. Uh, can you, could you use the oxygen three to H beta ratio to constrain once the metallicity is determined? Could you use that to constrain the, the stellar range within the like ten million years? Stellar range. Yes, because oxygen is very sensitive to stellar range, much more than H beta. Well, or the or 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 the number of. Uh, very massive stars. The massive, yeah, probably the number of massive stars you can constrain. But it's the, the, the stellar age of the population, I should. But they, they, they jump the jump is stellar age. The larvas, the starburst population. More or less. Yeah. And you, you said something about uh, trying to reduce the uncertainty of the, uh, the W parameters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering. Uh, what's needed for that? Do you need a larger sample? Do you need we expect that we do not need a larger sample. Essentially, we need a larger sample with the red shifts 2.5 and 3. Um, with the red shifts 2 and 3. That's it. The advantage of this methodology is fundamentally, fundamentally <laughs> that we can observe relatively easily up to red shift 3. It's for me, when I, it's very difficult to get out beyond red shift 2, even beyond red shift 1.5. There are very few supernovae when I mm -hmm. beyond red shift 1.5. 
Now, what would happen with the GWST? That would be a good question. With GWST, you can get even farther away. And if everything goes the same, mm -hmm. I think that you, not, you may not know, but maybe you still could go to further, uh, further away in redshift, like four. Still, the maximum difference between models is around redshift two and three. So redshift four maybe is not that, that different. But would be interesting. And, and I was also wondering, is there a way to get uh, further away in redshift with H2 galaxies? Uh, we expect that it still will be easier with H2 galaxies than with Spernoli one. The main thing is that almost every star forming galaxy will have, well, not every, but many star forming galaxies will have a massive star formation. So, and, and you see even more frequently that at the early universe. And the first. For this hour, let's see <laughs> what happens there. Uh, I have a question. You, you mentioned uh, Redshift 4. Which is the wavelength where you will locate the oxygen? Yeah, that, could, that can be done with JWST. Okay, yes, so it's what intermediate, is that wavelength? Okay. I think some people online have. Uh, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, if there are no more questions from the auditorium, we have we do have. Uh, so, uh, Roberto Terlevich has a question. Uh, well, I have a comment actually. Uh, for us working witnessing remotely, it's very difficult to follow the discussion. So it would be a good um, approach if the speaker repeats the question before providing the answer. Uh, that, 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 that's a, that's a, a suggestion. Uh, it, I would like to make two points, actually, uh, one in relation with the underlying absorption correction. These H2 galaxies are the objects, the star, star formation systems with the strongest emission line in the universe. They are selected because they have the strongest emission lines. And the minimum, uh, 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 the minimum equivalent width of H beta to be in the catalog is 50 Armstrongs while the maximum absorption for the underlying population that's mainly blue supergiants uh, in this case is always below, below 10 Armstrong. So underlying absorption is a small correction to the flux. And, um, and uh, the other point was uh, I forgot now. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. Well, we have a question from Marosa. Hello. Thank you. Uh, it's also a comment, and I think it's very much along the same line as Roberto's. No, I, I am under the impression that these things um, have very low metallicity. Yeah. And, I, and, and because of that, also very little dust. I think it is a selection effect because otherwise you wouldn't see them as each two galaxies. And I think that is also a good point because probably H2 galaxies at high redshift are very similar to H2 galaxies at low redshift. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, what about, for example, in 30, you see that the, the whole cavity has been evacuated. That's why you see the stars and there's very little extinction. It is because of the winds and the supernovae and everything you have there. So maybe it's that's the reason you have very low extinction because you're detecting the stars in the middle of them. Yeah, well, we are measuring the gas essentially. Uh, yeah, I see you. Yeah, but it but also to have them low metallicity, it has to be not now, but along the history of the universe. These things don't have metals. Okay. But well, in fact, they are very, very low metals in general. If I may, uh, I think that both Rosa and Enrique are right. And <laughs> the point is that the dust uh, associated with the ionized gas, it, 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 it has very low, the ionized gas has very low dust content. And, uh, but it also is true that the, 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 the ionizing cluster blows a bubble 
that that affects mainly the observed continuum, not the emission lines. So the observed continuum is the one that shows very little extinction associated with the with the wind blown bubble, while the emission lines are mixed with dust, but there is a low metallicity and low dust. I remember now the point I, I, I was trying to make before, and it's in relation with the age determination using the uh, O3 to HP ratio. Uh, uh, although in principle might be a, a good approach, the O3 to HP ratio is bimodal with metallicity. So high metallicity systems have weak O3 because they are very cool, and low metallicity systems have uh, low O3 because there is very little oxygen. And so it turns out that the, the O3 to H beta is very sensitive to metallicity. Uh, so, um, and uh, it is also sensitive to, to evolution, but the equivalent width is more sensitive to evolution and has no me metallicity, uh, uh, strong metallicity dependence. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments? Yeah. Perhaps in the auditorium? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will pick up. Uh, so in relation to the previous comment from Dr. Uh, Cambridge, so do you think that you have any potential bias arising from the selection effect? You know, is, is this sample complete? I, I know it's... <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think it's messy the selection function. No? But, yeah, I didn't talk much about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is I'm sorry, uh, Ricardo. There's... Sorry. Uh, uh, so uh, the people on Zoom could not hear the question. Could you repeat? Yeah, it? the question about it was about this the probable the, the bias a probable bias associated with the selection selection of, uh, selection methodology. So yeah, we know that there is a bias, a manifest bias, a strong manifest bias associated with that. We have calculated it. We have already in, in the previous papers mentioned it and correct by the results. We are now working in a much more systematic way of also, we have other systematics in total. We have the metallicity dependent, we know that. We have an age dependence of the age of the bars dependence. And we have essentially that those are the, the a, a size dependent, size of the, of the, of the system, because as, as I said before, it's a kind of fundamental plane. We have a plane between luminosity and velocity dispersion and size, essentially. So we are we have quantified all these systematic uncertainties at some point. We are working now in a new determination of all the systematics together. And uh, well, we will expect to have soon results on all the, all the systematic effects. Yeah. And soon. Thank you. An update version. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. Uh, uh, if there are no other questions or comments, let us uh, thank our speaker. And thank you very much to the audience for stimulating discussion. Um, we will see you next week. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.